All right. All right, thank you. Okay, hopefully this will work well. First, let me welcome you all. Uh, the presentation that I have today it is, it is something that I never have done before. But I thought it would be interesting for some of you to know about Latin American culture in general. And then, you know, I would also present some books that I think would be part of the book of your life. Maybe you already have them, so it's not something new for you. But uh, maybe it will be something new for you. And what I'm thinking is uh, that uh, maybe I will develop a uh, like a special topic uh, for for the winter session on Latin America. There's so much uh, to learn. Okay, so let's uh, before we enter into literature, let's go to history. So we know where we are. So this is uh, uh, Spain. Yeah. Spain. And uh, this is a, a Iberic Peninsula. Okay. Here we have Portugal. And here we have several kingdoms that are now nowadays uh, Spain. The peninsula, when we see the Iberic Peninsula, had little kingdoms. Even Portugal was a kingdom. And they have different languages. Okay. Most of them are, of course, uh, derived from uh, Latin. So they are Romance, except this, uh, that's why it has a different color. This place here in the, in the Cantabric, in the north of Spain, which has a totally different language that nobody knows where it came from, is the last name. So Jacob asked me for my last name. And my, for my father's side, I'm last. And my last name is Alice Miguel. That has nothing to do with Spanish or any other uh, Romance language. It means the, the oak tree on the hill. Imagine that, the oak tree on the hill. That's what my family name means. So there we, we speak something called Euskara, which is not Spanish and has nothing. Now, of course, we have uh, incorporated many Spanish words. It's funny because so last year I went to Spain and came there and went to Barcelona. In Barcelona, they want to be uh, Spanish. They want to speak Spanish. When you go to the Basque country, they have to speak Basque. So even for us uh, Spanish speaking people, we have no issue. Okay? Now, what we call Spanish today is actually what Castilian. It wasn't called Spanish because Spanish in Spain means it was one of the Romantic languages in the center of Spain, okay? And uh, that became dominant, and Spanish, uh, uh, Castilian became the dominant language of uh, that, uh, the peninsula, and when they consolidated after 14, around the discovery time in 1492, then uh, Spanish became the main language. Portugal kept theirs, the Portuguese. But if you go, like I was saying, if you go to any of the provinces, if you go to Catalonia, which is here, or to the Basque country, or here to the Catalan uh, area, they will speak their own language. That's what they learned in school. During the, there was a civil war in Spain in 1930, so 1936 uh, to 1939. And Franco, who was a dictator to power, and he was there for many years, since 1939 till the early 70s when he died. And of course, like any other dictator, what's the first thing they do? They don't like that. So they, they abolish all uh, the native languages. Like everybody has to learn Spanish and that's it. But after Franco uh, died and democracy came to Spain for the first time, I think, uh, but during the civil war, there was some, uh, in, especially in Catalonia, in the in Barcelona, in that area, uh, they they were they had a democracy for a while. Well, you know, every uh, province or every state or every region was able to go back to their culture and language. So we have to take into consideration that because we Latin American people come from that. Now, in terms of who were these people right there? 
And that's really, this is really cool. Uh, some historians believe that before the Celtics, there were people, of course, there was people there, there were people, there were, they were, there were people there, yes, there were people there that they called the idea. But there is little history about them because they, they mix with the Celtics. And of course, the Celtics were all over Europe. They also came to Spain. And so they were Celtic people, and we have a lot of uh, historical records of Celtics and uh, Celtic Celtics. Then, uh, so uh, the idea is that the Celtics uh, went to the peninsula in the year 600 uh, before our view. They arrived. And they were there until the Romans came. The Romans came in uh, 280. And that's where, of course, the, with the influence, uh, Roman was an empire, was the center of the world, and Latin was the language that they used. And that was disseminated in uh, the provinces of Spain. In 70 of our era came uh, uh, Sephardic uh, people. So they also wrote their own language and they do, they did make, uh, they created a new language too, called Latin. And I was very surprised because I went to Sevilla, Sevilla, and I went to this uh, 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 Jewish church and I was reading about the Sephardic people. And I realized that I knew a lot of Sephardic songs when I was growing up because that also became part of our culture too. Without, you know, it's, it's what we are. So, uh, special songs that your mother, you know, will sing to the, uh, how do you say that? Lullabies, lullabies. They, most of them, not more all, but some of them come from the Sephardic Sephardic And the Ladino, it's a it's a it's a derived also from the Romans, and it's you can read it. It's it's, it's a little bit complex, but we I took it, which I, which was a surprise. I didn't know anything about this. Then of course came the Visigoths, and they came from there was a, a German tribe, Germanic tribe that went there and conquered the Danish, okay? and that was. 14, uh, uh, 460, and then came Islam. And the family uh, in the, in the uh, Muslims, and uh, it's like a group of large group of people that they came to land uh, what uh, Mahoma called Landalus. Landalus is in that city today, but they call it Landalus. That's the, the Arabic name. And this family came from Syria. And these were the first uh, uh, people that came from the Middle East. All of you know, of course, they they went from from the from Asia to Africa and from Africa. You know, you almost can see uh, the Iberic Peninsula because it's very close. The, it's when you enter the Mediterranean. That's, so they came there and they stay there till today because. We also have, all of us who are uh, from Spanish descent, have a lot of uh, Arabic culture. We didn't know, but we do. So a lot of words that we use are uh, from Arab origins. In 1492, they, they, by the way, the Islam was there. Mahoma, I think, I'm not very sure about this, but I think he was. Uh, uh, his time was like in the fifth uh, century and or sixth century, like 500 or 600. And Mahoma, uh, or oh, is that what you call the English Mahoma? Mohammed. Mohammed. Oh, oh Mohammed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm talking about the prophet. Oh, we're talking about Native American. No, no, no. I'm talking about the prophet. How do you call the prophet? Mohammed. Mohammed. Okay. I call it Mahoma. You see? Because I, I know a little bit of that. Uh, so, well, Mohammed must have been a very intelligent guy because in few in, in a few years he was able to disseminate this this new religion, which was he totally new. He got a lot of information from uh, uh, Hebrew or from Jewish religion and from Christianity because that was uh, like five six centuries after Christ. But he created you know, 
uh, the Hebrew. And he it's amazing because the uh, Islam empire was huge. You can now we see, well, you know, but it was uh, half of the world was Islam. And in just a few years, and there were all the religions there. All the things that we studied when we studied Western civilization and where, where Western civilization was born, the Mesopotamian river and all of that. Well, they became in 50 years, they became, uh, they became uh, Muslim. So that's, that's an amazing. So I'm, I don't know, that calls my attention so much that now I'm studying uh, Islam. Really? I have to say, I have to know more about this. And when I went to Sevilla, of course, uh, when you go to Andalusia, you will see the music influence of, uh, of uh, Arabic and Islam culture. And it's beautiful. You go to the Alhambra, uh, and you go to Sevilla, to the Casa of Sevilla. Those places are amazing if you want to learn a little bit about that uh, Islamic culture. Even people from foreign people from the Middle East, they go there to see that because uh, it's, it's one. So, so, but that's where we are, we are now. So I'm, I am Iberian, Celtic, Roman, Sephardic, Visigoth, Islam, and Basque. Not me, every, every Latin. Then came the discovery. And the Cristobal Colón or Christopher Columbus came to America. And we live in America. So all this mix from centuries and centuries ago, ended up here in Latin America. Well, I would say from North America to the South, because the Spanish came to North America to the English of the well. uh, So they, they, the Spaniards that came already had the, all of these components here, and they added uh, Native America. So in my culture and any culture or any place in Latin America, we, the food that we eat, of course, in the South, Spanish food, uh, Native American. Everything is, is, is our national. Uh, we don't have the distinction. Okay, this is Native American. This is uh, so, no, because we are Latin American. So we are a mixed species. Then came the African influence with the African type that were brought to to America. That's why we have such a good music in Latin America because they brought the rhythm, right? The salsa. Jazz, all the music that is uh, the origins are in Africa, and so we are African too. We have African, uh, 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 even African born. And finally, uh, and I, 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 I couldn't place any exact day. There, you know, there is people from all over the world. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you, remember because that happened many years ago. The president of Peru was a uh, Javan, Fujimori, to remember that today. So why? Because there's a large community of Japanese uh, uh, in, in, in Peru. And that's why Peru uh, 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 food is so good. We've never been in a Peruvian restaurant. Uh, well, we don't find one here in, in Peru, but please do. It has nothing to do with Mexican food, which is very good too. And because we eat different things. Uh, depending on you know who came, and then of course Portuguese, Italians, uh, uh, Asian, so they are part of our. The way Latin America has developed is a little different than the U.S. Here in the U.S., what I have learned is that you keep your groups like we are all together, but you know I'm Italian American. I'm what we don't have. We are Latinos people, okay. Uh, because we have all this mix, not only in culture, but also in Why? Uh, I don't know if that was it or not. That's what it is. Okay. So culture in Latin America is derived from all these uh, groups, historical and uh, groups and cultural groups. And then, now you understand what Latin America means, let's go to Talk a little bit about people. Are there any questions? No? Okay. 
Oh, sorry. No, I used to use two computers at the same time. Oh, okay. In Latin America, uh, of course, that's all in Latin. But it was following the same general uh, movements that you had, like, like modernism, classics, romanticism. You know, that was what people wrote in the century, 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, 16th century. But in the 20th century came what is called magic realism. And magic realism is something really special. I think I don't think this is only talk to Latin America. I'm sure that happens everywhere. But it became like a movie. And why was that? Uh, why were the writers who were able to create that new style? Is because of what I explained. So if you were uh, Muslims, Jewish, uh, Africans, uh, uh, natives, Spaniards. So for us, that's you know nothing new. So what they did is they wrote the stories that they that they heard when they were little kids. My dad uh, always tells me, you know, if I could write, it would be like uh, Garcia Marquez. Right? Because that's uh, that's how I grew up. We didn't see a distinction between what it was real and what it was natural. Because that's the story that you get that from your family. There's a book that I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit uh, later that is the, uh, by called the, uh, the War of the End of the World by uh, by it's very good. No, no, it will be there. Don't worry. But the amazing thing is that there is the book. I, I read that book and I was going to tell the whole story. So the book is about like uh, uh, indigenous people and uh, the struggle and all of that. The interesting thing is there is a prophet there, prophet who was from going from town to town saying that he was being educated. But my grandmother, very, uh, she was very, uh, passed away many years ago, but uh, she would tell me the story about a prophet that went through uh, her time. And she was born in 1900, so it would have been like 19, I think it was 1910. And there was a lot of smoke for, for months because a small part of the savanna had uh, burned. For the Grand Savannah. It, it's a beautiful place to visit because you see that the buoys, the, the, the buoys are like mountain formations that are uh, at the black rock. They are, you know, well, really huge and tall. I mean, those mountains um, are like maybe 2,000 uh, meters, which would be times three, would be like six, 7,000 uh, uh, So there was a big uh, uh, fire, uh, it wasn't a forest fire, it was a savannah fire, but they didn't know because they were like maybe 200 miles away from that place in 1920. And so they had smoke like for weeks. And during that time, these prophets, the prophets for the like the Bible, came to that town telling everybody that it was the end. And people believe, and unfortunately some people believe from the so they didn't want to wait to well, in um, Vargas Llosa, that's his name, Mario Vargas Llosa, this is one of the novel plus. In, in his novel, The Work of, uh, of the End of the World, he talks about a problem, you know? So it's, it's, it's okay, there is magic values. By the way, and that's a story with Vargas Llosa. I went to Peru in 1986. I was part of the delegation. It had to do with information. So I went to Peru. Peru is a beautiful country. And we were in this restaurant, which I think is at the time one of the best restaurants in Peru. Peru uh, cuisine is mostly come from the sea. They have the cuisine. And we were there. And I was reading that book, 1986, 87. And all of a sudden, in the next table, I see butter. And of course, for me, it was all my. I didn't want to interrupt him because 
when you're famous, you don't want to be interrupted when you're having a lunch or being able to spend with friends. So I was like, I couldn't, I, I was sitting with three or four uh, four or five other people there and they were discussing really important matters, but I don't remember anything yeah. of the conversation. You were trying to listen what the uh, you know the maestro Vargas Llosa was saying. So when he paid his uh, bill and he was a I I was talking, I said, uh, Maestro, I'm reading your book. Uh, I said, Oh really? Yeah, what's your name? And, and he, 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 he was very pleasant. And then he left. To me that was the highlight of the book. I didn't get anything about what you were doing there. Yeah. In the, it matters. So, magic realism is when we have, uh, when we adopt things that look magical, but we tell them as real, as something real that happens, as magic. Does. And that became a style of Latin American uh, fiction. And uh, because it's magic realism and Latin American history. We are full of magic and fiction, and we don't know which is which. Right? So uh, the, the, we have uh, Carpentier, who was uh, from Cuba. He's one of the first ones. Of course, Garcia Marquez, that everybody knows. Uh, uh, Jorge Amado from Brazil. Borges, which is, the, to me, is the most important writer. Cortázar and Isabel Allende, and Vargas Llosa, and many others. They, they, uh, they, their stories are magic realism. That's like a style. The other important uh, milestone is what is called the boom. And the boom was based on magic realism. That's, you know, in the, I would say the 50s and the 60s. When they were able to play with uh, uh, how uh, people grow. People were writing in the way of uh, European politics who were writing and they were following the same rules. But these people said, well, you know, we live in this continent and this is different and, and our culture is different. And we have so many uh, origins that let's try the way we see the world. And that was called the boom. So Latin American literature became very uh, great around the world. Before that, it wasn't that much because there was nothing to see there. It was like the same class in the realistic and monolistic literature that you could see. Here in the US, you have something similar when uh, Faulkner and uh, Hemingway and all of those big guys came and, and changed uh, literature. But before that, it was more like okay, the same story that uh, anybody tried. So, so the boom was very important because they were uh, using magic realism. So we have, again, Julio Cortázar, uh, Cortázar, Carlos Fuentes, Jorge Amado, uh, Jose Donoso. And then this is something that happens everywhere in Latin America. And I don't know if they, maybe the, the writers uh, got together in conferences and talk about this or not. I have no idea about that, but that's something that we have to investigate. But they came up with this and then became very popular as writers that they would not as, uh, so so that's why we know uh, nowadays we know Garcia Marquez who's the main uh, writer on on magic realism some of the uh, sources that I recommend for uh, your book list are this you know they I, I went through it and I found very good books in Latin American uh, these books that I'm going to present are a translation to me. Because I think most of our, our patrons are English speaking patrons. They are, of course, uh, editions in Spanish, but the original editions are in Spanish. But I think uh, uh, we can disseminate more if they are uh, offered to me. Yes. So now you, I know, I know, let me sit down. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> my old nemesis. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because I, I took my way through Babel, the book Babel. Um, and, but it's interesting because it was talking about languages and how they have to translate them and the amount that you lose when you translate it from one language to the other. And since you can read both, what do you think? lose like do you are, are our translators 
better now than they used to be, or is it worse? Like, you know, like sometimes you can get a concept, but then you can't get a concept. So what what are your thoughts? My thoughts are yeah. And they are sorry. Of course, there are some versions that are better. Better. By the way, you don't have to copy anything. I will share that with you. Even though it's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. My feeling is that you get into a lot of specific feelings. I don't even really know how to explain it. It's like that uh, hidden meaning that, uh, you know, because when you translate, you have to get a feeling because it's based on culture. So when I read something from Latin America, I exactly know what I'm feeling. When you read it in English, you don't feel the same way because they are translated to the word that they cannot translate. It's like, uh, what's the name of the story of uh, me? Uh, it's like you have a horseshoe here. Okay, you, that's good luck, right? Okay. Well, if you translate uh, horseshoe in Spanish, it doesn't mean anything. Well, you will really get a meaning because it's a different code. So, yes, it is part of that uh, symbolic meaning. One experience that I had, my kids, they speak Spanish, but not very good. And of course, they don't read. So, they have never tried. They, they do have, they can have a conversation uh, like, uh, with the family, but when it gets a little bit more complex, then they cannot handle it because they don't have the vocabulary. So, my son asked me that I would like to read Garcia Marquez, uh, C C C I the Zodiac, 100 years of time. Okay, uh, I'll get you the copy. And I said, Do you want the English version or the Spanish? No, I'm going to read the Spanish. All right, all right, good. So I got him the Spanish version. After like three pages, he told me, I can like, look at them. No, no, I'm sorry. Okay, then I had to get him the English version. And he was able to read both with the two versions, but he was asked, that was okay, what did you do? Was, uh, maybe when he was here with me, what did you do? Ask me what do they mean by the what, what happened here? So I have to explain like magic relish. Well, that's not something uh, that is happening. This is uh, this, this is magic. So yes, that's that's a big problem. But how how can we overcome that? We can, you know, because if I want to be, uh, I'm reading in English now. I have to read it in English or Spanish. I cannot be very blind. So. Of course, I'm using our, especially with this philosophy. So what I'm doing is I'm reading it and I'm listening to a podcast on Nietzsche by the professor of philosophy who is explaining me what Nietzsche meant. That me my All right, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> you know, I have a question. So like, so you can ask any. Okay. So uh, everybody's welcome. To ask. We're, we're very small in rural. We don't have a lot of diversity, but I try to do something. So once you, so we have a copy of Don Quixote in English and Spanish. Would you think it would be better just to have just a copy and just only that, or a copy that has both that they can kind of go back and forth? Well, just in your opinion. I mean, it's a, okay, this is my opinion. If we want to reproduce our data, because if, if we all, you know, overburden them with, okay, you need to do this and they should all, I'm not an expert. I wouldn't do that for everything, but I just meant like, yeah, that would be a good idea to have a copy of uh, just in the original language and the two. I, I would love to learn because I can be both like, but for somebody who can, you know, and of course, there are things that aren't universal. That has to be person. So even if you don't get the small details or the small uh, atmosphere or the small thing, you still get the story. That's why, for example, uh, Isabella Allende, they have made, you know, it's uh, very popular here in the US and they have made many books uh, uh, from the writers, right? Because, you know, it's still interesting and has to be. So, so they do, uh, they, of course, they, it's based on what uh, uh, 
stories of Latin American but this is fiction and there are thrillers, mysteries, uh, murders, you know, everything there, the stories for uh, kids, everything that that anybody I think would be you know, and, and they so yeah, I mean you're gonna do something, but uh in, at least you're getting that diverse. Because one of my points, uh, I, I teach a multicultural class that I do this, we have to think about that we do have diversity even here in the city. Because it's, it's not only about like uh, gender or race, which is, of course, but it's also about age, about uh, uh, education, about level of, of uh, income. That's diversity. So, so we have to understand that we find diversity everywhere. Okay? So these are some some of the best books, please. But I'm sure you have better resources because all of you are like and uh, more like professional oriented for librarians. Uh, okay, let's go to. Uh, let me see my time. Oh, no. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, it doesn't matter because you're gonna you. you we're gonna review the books, but not really into that. I'm just gonna mention something, but this, like I said, this I will share this. And if you want, in the summertime, you can invite me, I'll go to your library and, and do like a multicultural night. Yeah, but you have to pay all my expenses uh -huh, and take me to dinner too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Don't think it's gonna be free. <laughs> all right. Maybe we need to get a grant. For for this, okay. Okay. So I was gonna. I forgot. I mean, I'm gonna add a little bit. I have a math question. So you know what the concept is. I know all of you are educated people, but if you are presenting in, in the library, what is Argentina? What is Chile? What is Uruguay? Paraguay? Oh, what is uh, what is Central America? Or countries that you know, it may be confusing. Mm -hmm. There are so many little countries that that it was confusing. Uh, uh, there was an idea that didn't happen because of our. Okay, where we are. It happened in the U.S. because I would have the United States. Well, they do. They do have the same idea. A little bit later, the United States, early eighteen uh, hundreds, of adding one country. From Mexico to Argentina, that was never going to happen, of course, because even even though we have the same goods, there is a lot of diversity. So, uh, so it was going to be called Colombia, like like uh, like Colombia today, because that was in honor of Christopher Columbus. So we have one big big country that didn't happen. Then Simon Bolivar said, "Well, let's do it in a smaller here with uh, Ecuador." Uh, Venezuela and then and what is what's called La Nueva Granada, which is Colombia today. And they call that La Gran Colombia. But that it lasted like three years and there was a civil war. That was their last uh, attempt to do that. Uh, was that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't know. But uh, I think we have a lot of diversity, which is one thing that happened to me this time. It's like me and my daughter were invited to have dinner at this professor's house here, a friend of mine. And, and, and when we get there, he says, Oh, I cook your food for you. So I said, Wow, that's great. Thank you so much. When I see the table, it's all different types of dishes. Well, we don't eat this in Venezuela, like maybe they do in Guatemala, Mexico, or wherever. So, well, I said, oh, thank you so much, and I, and I, I knew she was doing this from a good heart, right? But it's hard to understand the diversity. We are not the same, just like in the U.S. It's not the same somebody from the Midwest and from California or from here, from Pennsylvania. Well, the same thing happened there. I said, yeah, I can eat some, some beans, but I, I've seen some beans here that I've never seen in my life. And she said, diversity of beans. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we have... We have different music, we have different musical instruments, we speak Spanish differently. Every country says that no, it's our Spanish is the best. Yeah. According to this, well, you go to Spain and they, they speak horribly in Spain. I can tell you that we speak better Spanish than they do. You go to Andalusia and you don't understand anything. Even the, they think they're speaking Spanish, but they're like, 
So yeah, we do speak better than them. And they say, and this is not a question, but I, I read that in Bolivia, the way they speak their real the more experienced. Uh, remember I said that uh, what you think was the thing. Well, they said that that's the closest experience in Bolivia. I don't know if that's true or not, I've never been there, but that's what I got to say. Uh, okay, so, oh, by the way, I have like different countries. I could, these are books that I have read uh, in my last 60 years. okay? Some I remember, some I don't. I'm gonna read, read them now, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna read them in English, okay? Because I, I was reading, really, okay, I, I selected my books, and then I went to read about it. Oh, because I read this when I was 12 years old. So uh, you know, I'm going to read them uh, because these were really good books. Really good books. Uh, I, there's no, like, I was going to have them in geographical order with the map, but at the end, I, I, you know, I go from one place to another place. This is Mexico, of course. We all know where Mexico is. And Mexico, the two. Uh, I would say the two poles of uh, great uh, Latin American literature are Mexico and Latin America. Uh, of course, you have that in Peru, you got Vargas Llosa in Colombia, you got uh, uh, Garcia Marquez. Yeah, but in general, I would say that's the two, because they were the two richest countries. Argentina was very rich. Uh, in, in, that's why. Borges, which I'll mention later, said that Argentina, they have, they have a lot of immigrants from Italy. So almost Italian. If you see the soccer team, Argentina soccer team, beginning with uh, Maradona or Messi, you know, those are Italian uh, sons of Italian people. So Borges, who was a great Argentinian writer, and I think he's uh, the best writer, uh, he said that Argentina is a collection of Italians who don't. Know how to speak Italian. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all Italian, they don't know how to speak that. Well, Mexico, and this is one of the great Mexican writers and poets, is Octavio Paz. I think he died uh, a few years ago. He got the Nobel Prize. And this is a, a, a great novel to read because it's about uh, cultural, you know. Uh, I guess cultural identification of Mexico and the rules and all of that. It's called uh, the Labyrinth of Solitude. He, he has many other great uh, books, but this one I got because I read that one. The other one that is you not know, here is Sor Juana de Inés, which is, was a monk, a uh, nun that became a saint, and he wrote about her. She was a poet too. So oh, that, that's two good books by, by Octavio Paz. He's one of the pillars of Latin American culture and literature. Well, all of the all of the persons I'm gonna mention. We have another Mexican here, Carlos Fuentes. And Carlos, this is a great book to uh, if you want to introduce any, anyone in uh, Latin American culture, as a Mexican culture, because it talks about uh, and also about the relationship of Mexico with the Spanish. Uh, in Spanish, it's called El Espejo Integrado. And he talks about what I talked today. I read this book, I don't know, many years ago, but he talked about that we are a hybrid culture, talking about Latin America, because of all our culture. We're a hybrid culture. There is another one that it was uh, it's very famous called Terra Nostra. He was a political figure too. By the way, Mexicans are very nationalistic with their, they love their country, really. That, that's a good thing. Then uh, from Argentina, we have Julio Cortaz. He, he's one of the major figures of, uh, of uh, writing. And this is more like a, like a thriller. Uh, it's called Rayuela in Spanish, and it takes place in Paris. So it, 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 it doesn't have to be about indigenous people or in, not me, it's about modern life, okay? And 
I, this is a story about this guy, Horacio Oliveira, who lived in Paris and has a his person. No? So this is a great story. It doesn't this what I wanted to show today is that it doesn't have to be about like traditions and about you know this uh, aspect the guy or Inca with his uh, llama. No, this is a, you know there are modern histories that are the same genres that we can find in any language. Okay. This is a great book. Uh, called Rayuela, and, and all the kids in Latin America have to read this book when they are in like, in, I don't know, 11th grade or something. Okay, here's my favorite from Argentina too, Jorge Luis Borges. And he's got this story, which I have, I sometimes make a copy uh, for, for my students called The Library of Babel. And The Library of Babel is like, it's like, when he wrote that in 1941, well, it's like the Indian, but it's a magical space where you go every, and there are an infinite number of rooms that in that uh, uh, library. And you go here, you go there, and you find this book, and then the book disappears. That's a, for a librarian, that's a great story. It's a short story. So I recommend this uh, 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 fiction story. He, he wrote many, many things, but this is great. This is a, and that especially that one, the Library of Babel. So I do copies. I know that I'm, I'm maybe I'm infringing copyright violation, but I share that with my students. You know, maybe it's not a whole story, but like something. It's a good Oh, this is being recorded. No, no, I don't never do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is another guy from Argentina, so called Ernesto Sabato. And this is a thriller because there is a murder and all of that. And so it's called The El Tunnel of the Tunnel. That's a great uh, story. That's fiction, thriller. And it takes place on the city. So, so it's, uh, this, is, this is a literature that anybody can read and they will enjoy. And there is paranoia, there is craziness. Yeah. Then from Chile, we have Jose Donoso. He uh, is a great writer too. And and I think this is, this is a, how to do with, a little bit with religion and mystery. This is a, a mystery type of that I really recommend. You, know, you just want to have fun with the summer, go ahead and do it. There's a description. He, he, in a maze of musty forgotten hallways, would he do the magic to find so far in the space? There's a, so this is like a mystery. I uh, The question about translation, I don't know. I'm going to read them in English now. See if I, if I can get what I got from the most growing. I'm old and I can't read the title. Well, it says the obscene, uh, uh, right, right here. The obscene bird of the night. Okay. We will share this. From Chile, of course, Isabel Allende. And uh, maybe, has anybody watched, uh, seen a movie uh, that it was uh, or no, based on one of her movies? No? She's very famous in Hollywood and makes a couple of movies. Uh, this is one of their major uh, books. Uh, the House of the Spirits. The one that I like that she wrote was about her daughter. I think it's called Father, but I'm not sure now that her daughter died. So she wrote some, she wrote a book about her. But it's, uh, it's a wonderful book. But this is, this is, this is I think this is, you know, uh, the bestseller. And they say here that they made a movie in, in 1994. I think I saw that movie, but I don't remember. It's about a family. Oh, Pablo Neruda. If you like, if you love poetry, this is the guy you have. There are two major poets, in my opinion. Of course, more than just a poet. Uh, but in Latin America, it's Pablo Neruda. Uh, and Especially this book, 20 points, yeah, it's a it's a love one. And the best one is poem number one. And it talks about 
how sad he is. And he says this, Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Escribir, por ejemplo, la noche está estrellada y gritan azules los pastos. So, he's talking about his beloved and, you know, they have to return and all that. He said, oh, I used to, I love uh, poetry, so I used to recite a lot of it. Uh, and I always uh, recite uh, Pablo Neruda. He's a Chilean guy. Uh, he died, uh, I think he died after the, uh, he was a communist and he supported the agenda government. He, he didn't die in the violent hand of that day. I think he got the Nobel Prize too. Uh, I, I'm not very sure. I don't know if he says there. Uh, but this is, this is, this is a book that I keep with me. It's my, one of my compliments. The other thing, what of course, is the, uh, the poet from Israel. What's, it, what's his name? Uh, they made movies about him. And he has this great poem called uh, La. Uh, it says, Y que yo me la llevé al río, creyendo que era mozuela, pero tenido. Fue la noche de Santiago y entre compromisos. This is a great poet, and he, he died violently when the civil war, the Spanish civil war. Uh, Trying to remember his name, I'll, I'll remember now. But we're not talking about Spanish literature, we're talking about Latin America. So Pablo Neruda, if you like poetry, and especially this book. He wrote prose too, but he wasn't as good as his poetry. In Bolivia, we have this uh, story, she's a new uh, writer, and this is about, uh, uh, they, they leave this kid or this uh, couple of kids in, in in, in, oh my gosh, where is it? Uh, let me see if you hear. Oh, in the Metis Reservation, I think that's in Canada. So you have uh, 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 magic realism too, and it is so worrying. By the way, when we see Latin America, we also we have different Latin America, we have lots of them. But you can see it too as cultural regions. So Mexico and Saint, most of Central America and Peru and Bolivia are mostly native driven cultures. Because why? Because uh, the, the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Toltecs were there and those were huge civilizations. They were very advanced. In Peru and Bolivia, the same thing. They had the Incas, and the Incas were very advanced. So much that when the Europeans came, they couldn't believe, you know, the, the size of Mexico. You know. And of course, the the they, they asked the Aztecs didn't Mexico; it was uh, uh, the Toltecs. And they say, I, I'm not uh, very familiar with the Mexican history, but they came from the north, took over and slave everybody there. And but they had some people before them had been that very civil. So there is a lot of uh, Native American influence because there were millions of people in those two countries, uh, Guatemala, Mexico, and Central America, and then in Bolivia and Peru, where the Incas too. If you go to Peru, you will go and see the Incas there. Uh, and the great city of the Incas called Machu Picchu, for example. That's a beautiful place to be. I was there when I was young. I don't know if I can go today because it's like 5,000 meters high. So it's you know very low oxygen uh, environment. Uh, the other place is what I call the Caribbean. I'm from the Caribbean. I'm a Caribbean, and we we had uh, uh, Native Americans, but they weren't as advanced as the as the They were fewer. So the Caribbeans were from island to island, you know. Maybe trading or sometimes warring, uh, whatever they they live at that you know, those times. So our uh, culture, my culture, uh, and I was at Venezuela, parts of Colombia, uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. We are more. Uh, uh, we are more Africans than native. So we have a different outlook, right? Because we have more African knowledge. Uh, 
I'm going to finish. Don't worry. Everybody wants to go to lunch. Okay, I'm going to go faster. I'm not going to talk anymore. Okay, Peru, Vargas Llosa. This is a story that I was telling you about the war of the end of the world and the prophet that my grandmother saw. That's a great book too. Uruguay. This is a great po this is a, a great poet, uh, uh, but he has uh, written prose to Mario Benedetti. Can you see that's a, an Italian name, an Italian French name already, a Corsican name. Onetti, the same thing, Italian, Corsican, French. That's a great uh, uh, writer from, from Uruguay. And this is his uh, A Brief Life. This is one of his masterpieces. From Colombia, of course, Garcia Marquez. Uh, you know, he's like the he's like the Hemingway of Latin America, or maybe the Faulkner. Who is the most important writer, more popular, right? Steinbeck, Hemingway. Well, he's he's like he's. He died three years ago. I don't remember when, but uh, it wasn't that long ago. And he wrote this in, in nineteen sixty three, sixty four. And then he became he became a huge uh, popular. This is if you want to know what magic realism is, this is the book that you have. To, this is magic realism. This is the boom. In from Venezuela, we have uh, Gallegos, who was the president of Venezuela, uh, and he was a great novelist. And he had many. I I have to read all his. Uh, in school, all the works. This is the best. In, well, Canaima was very good, too. But this is the best work. It's called Doña Barbara. And he wrote this, and uh, intellectuals and writers and, and comics and stand up comedians can do that. They can overcome uh, censorship. So they are smart enough to overcome censorship. So he wrote this book when there was a dictator in Venezuela that he followed. Uh, uh, that was for many years there, and it was good. And he was from the center of it. And he even dedicated this book to him. But it was the book is a novel that happens in the southern plains, and it's a, a civilization against barbarians. And what he wanted to show was that that regime at the time was a regime of bad Of course, poor one center Gomez who was a Whatever he was, he couldn't understand that, so he was very proud of, of having that book uh, 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 dedicated to him. Uh, so that became that become one of his uh, major works. I love this book. I highly recommend it. From Cuba, we have Alejo Carpentier. He is one of the uh, uh, initial proponents of magic literature. So. It's also a book that you can read. And this, this uh, the kingdom of this world is about Haiti. And when there was a revolution there. By the way, I don't know if you know, but that one of the, I think it was the first country in Latin America that was uh, got their independence for Haiti. That's amazing. And uh, so when Simon Bolivar needed, uh, like, money and funding and arms he had to go to Haiti and talk to the young who was a president and he provided with a substitute fighting in, in Colombia, Venezuela and Peru and Chile and all those places. So Alejo Carpentier, yeah, he's good. Uh, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, I love uh, this guy too, but this is mostly about cities and city life in Havana in the 1950s. So this is a great novel to read. I read one of his books called uh, Holy Smoke, and it's beautiful too, because tobacco is very important in, in Latin people, because that's where the tobacco or We had tobacco here in the community, but uh, like cigars, they come from Cuba. That's where you can get the best cigars. I used to go to Cuba, I, mean, I went like seven times, seven times because I had some friends there. And actually, my wife and I had our own family. It'd be very interesting, but of course, it's, you can see how rich Cuba was. Uh, and it's not the same now. Hopefully, they will one day be what they were. But the, the Havana, it's a beautiful city. It's in ruins, but it's, you can see that it was a really beautiful city. 
it was like the center for many years of commerce and other. We don't forget about the American influence of the casinos so from the colonial times. Havana was also the core. We're going to Europe, Havana taken over. So it was a very, very important. Uh, the last book that I have for you is, because I know you are hungry, is this one. And this one is more like an indigenous book. This is uh, uh, Miguel Angel Asturias. He's the um, uh, man of my, man of my space is uh, corn. And, and the main staple of uh, Central America. And here you I think, right, for the for the English, I think the uh, native here also had a lot of form. So, so this is a great book. Okay, my last story, and we end, Dr. Bahai, I promise you, this is my last story. In, in South America, we have another staple food called yuca. Are you, are you tried yuca? No, or yeah. uh, manicot, they call it in this uh, scientific. Well, there are two types. Well, there are many kinds, but two types that are identical. My father was a botanist, and he was a very good botanist, and uh, well recognized, and, and he was a taxonomist, and he couldn't differentiate one from the other, unless he had a magnifying glass and he could see the flower. So that's how botanists can uh, identify. And any farmer, peasant who deal with yucca could identify them just by looking at them. So this is yucca, sweet yucca, this is yucca. Yuca amarga is, 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 you make flour out of that flour, and you, but when you do the flour, you take all the poison out of that. And you make a bread, and it's very hard, very delicious. I love that. It's called cassava. Uh, the other one you can eat, you can boil it. So, this is a story. In one, I used to go with my dad when I was doing it many times and spend the summer in the, in the, in the Amazon forest. And because he was collecting plants uh, with uh, all the signs, uh, he went on to take me and I could give it uh, name. And you know, after two or three years, we became friends. friends from him. So later, I went when I was older, my father already had uh, died. And I talked to this friend of mine, I said, you know, so you know everything. He said, you know, Simon, what can happen here? No. Well, they draw the trees, the cattle trees, here to the our village, and he was very upset about uh, having uh, not everything is good, but they have like several wives, they marry uh, girls who are very young. He wanted to stop that, stop that. He didn't do it because it was about that. He tried to see how to be better. So they were fed up with these trees. So they invited him to eat boiled soup, but of course they put the other thing. That's why that's how they got rid of it. That's magic of the story. That's a story that you don't believe. Well, that happened if you thought it was told. You couldn't stand that this prison anymore, so we used to And of course, nobody, well, you know, we, 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 the police went there and see what happened to the prison. But we got confused. We just took it. Okay, fine. <laughs> so so <clears throat> magic, that's magic. And with this story, I am magic. Are there any questions? I know we're turning down that dinner invitation. I'm going to invite you all to my home at some juke. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy. So we're heading over, and like you said, the district is heading over. We don't know where it is, so many people are going to know. And then we can start the first, the next session starts at 1 30.